Hey, welcome back all you beautiful Bulletproof Handy Men and Women to the Bulletproof Handyman Business YouTube channel. So today we're going to be talking about markups. It's a semi-controversial subject within this industry. A lot of people mark everything up, a lot of people never mark anything up. What I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to be making my arguments to you. By the way, I'm one of the people that does not use markups. And I also want to be clear, so let's, let's define what a markup is real quick. My definition when I say markup is I'm talking about you spend X amount of dollars, say $100 on materials. A markup is where you just simply apply a percentage. So in this case, let's call it 100%. We apply 100% to those materials that we paid $100 for, so now they're $200 when we bill them to the client. That would be a markup. Similarly, you could do a 50% markup, so $100 in materials would be a $50 markup, and then we pass on to the client the total cost of $150. That's a markup, is applying a set percentage to all of your materials across the board and passing that cost on. I personally do not run my business that way, and I don't think that's the best way to do it. And what I'm going to do for you here today is I'm just going to lay out some basic arguments as to why I don't think that that's actually the way that's going to work best and lead to the most success for you and your business. So throughout the arguments that I'm going to make today, I'm going to use the exact same example of two different products to make each argument. And the two different products are going to be a $150 kitchen faucet and a $15 sheet of drywall. And what we're going to do is we're just going to apply markups to those two, and then we're going to see where that takes us as we fast forward it into the future, into the project, and passing that cost along to the client. So if the stated intent of us doing a markup is that we need to be reimbursed for our time and resources that we've invested into acquiring, handling, and transporting these materials, then let's look at the math and see if that actually happens when we apply a set markup to everything. So let's take our $150 faucet. How long is it gonna take to do that? We're gonna pull into Home Depot, so from the moment we park, let's say it's gonna be 20 minutes at most for us to walk into Home Depot, find the faucet, go to the checkout counter, come back out to the vehicle, and start driving away. We've invested 20 minutes of our time, not much energy, not much effort at all, not much thought, not much research, just 20 minutes of our time we've invested into this $150 faucet. So now let's apply a 100% markup to it, which is very common across the trades, is to simply double the price of all your materials. So now this $150 faucet is a $300 faucet, our client is going to receive an invoice that's going to say faucet $300 and chances are they're going to know what faucet it is because it's in their house and they saw the faucet go in. So we made $150 for 20 minutes of our time. Now let's apply that exact same 100% markup to our $15 sheet of drywall. Number one, the drywall is much heavier, right? So we're going to have to do more work. It's going to take more than the normal amount of time that it does to grab a faucet off the shelf. We're going to have to actually get a big cart I don't know about you, but typically for me, when I'm getting drywall, I'm needing to wait on somebody else or a couple other people who are also getting drywall. But even if I don't have to wait, I've got to get that bigger cart, I've got to go over to the drywall, I've got to do some handling of the drywall to get it onto the cart in such a way that I don't damage it especially, and then get it up to the checkout, take it out to the vehicle. But once we get to the vehicle, we probably don't already have room. Now, of course, you might be lucky and you may have a rack to put it on or something, but chances are... You've had to rearrange some things, clean some things out, and prepare your vehicle to be able to take that sheet of drywall to begin with. So we've used a lot more strength and energy. We had to think things out ahead of time and prepare the vehicle for it. Maybe we even had to bring a trailer for it. And then it just simply took more time and effort within the store to get that drywall. And similarly, we're going to have to drive differently. If we have an open top vehicle in the back, like a pickup truck, we now have to worry about whether that drywall is going to get wet or dirty during transportation. We may have had to drive faster or slower depending on how it's tied down or where it's at. And when we get to the property, it's also more work just getting it out of the vehicle and inside. Now, I'm not trying to say drywall is difficult, right? It's not, it isn't really all that hard to just go buy a sheet of drywall and take it to a job, but it is significantly easier to get a faucet and take it to a job. And yet with our numbers, with our 100% markup, we've made $150 off that easy faucet and we've only made $15 off of that sheet of drywall. So that's reason number one, is I don't think that adding a standard markup to your materials ever actually does accurately, and accurately is the key word, it doesn't accurately 
account for the time and resources that you invested into acquiring, handling, and transporting those materials. And now moving on to argument number two, we're going to apply again the same markup and the same standard process with the same materials, but to the storage of these materials should we want to buy them in advance and then hold them for a future job. So the faucet itself, right, we've bought it, we've got it home, and now we want to store it. What does it cost us to store it? Well, it's gonna cost us a little bit of space up on a shelf somewhere. It's gonna cost us a few square inches, a couple square feet of shelf space at most. It's not gonna take hardly any effort to put it on that shelf, and it's gonna be very easy to just buy it, put it on the shelf, take it off the shelf when you need it, take it to the job. Super easy, barely an inconvenience. And then now, again, if we look at that same four by eight sheet of drywall, and this is assuming it's four by eight and not four by 12. I'm gonna make it easy on us, and it's gonna be a four by eight sheet of drywall. So clearly, the acquisition and initial transportation to get it to our house or to our shop where we're going to store it, that took more effort just like it did for the first example. But now we wanna store it, so now we either have to have some sort of rack that we've built that's gonna take up four feet by eight feet of floor space, which is a significant amount of floor space, or if we lean it up on its end, we're now gonna risk damaging the edge of it, but it's also gonna take up more space because it's now taking up wall space where there could have been a shelf or there could have been any number of other things organized on that wall. I think it's abundantly clear that when it comes to storing the faucet, or storing the drywall, one takes significantly less resources to do and one takes significantly more resources to do. Meanwhile, the one that took less resources is actually going to make us more money. We're gonna be charging more for it. And the one that took more resources, we're going to be charging less for. So again, those numbers just don't work out. And for argument number three, let's go in really specifically to the handling itself. And there's gonna be two items I'm gonna really point out with the handling here. With our faucet, here's a faucet right here, right? So the handling of this faucet, pretty simple. In fact, I can toss that faucet over there and I guarantee you when I go open that box up, that faucet is all in one piece, not broken at all, super, super easy, barely an inconvenience. Also, it didn't harm my body picking it up and transporting it. Now let's look at that four by eight sheet of drywall and we've got two things we're gonna look at. Number one, just like you saw me toss that faucet, the opposite example is that sheet of drywall. If you've handled much drywall, you know it has to be handled very, very carefully. The wrong move and it's going to break. The wrong move and it's going to get gouged. The wrong move and it's going to get, to get dinged and dented and messed up. And oftentimes that does matter because when we damage the drywall, that's now extra drywall work that we've got to do with our joint compound on the job to clean that up and make it look nice again. And that's assuming we don't break it. And then number two, is the physical strength and the wear and tear on our bodies. Now, again, one sheet of drywall, really not a big deal. Anybody can just go get a sheet of drywall. It's not about the one sheet of drywall, but it's about the repeated sheets of drywall and plywood and other large heavy items over the years. Those are going to take a strain on our shoulders, which it has mine now that I'm finally 43, the shoulders starting to get weird. Your elbows, your hands, your wrists, your back, your whole body, so again, you're not really covering your costs on that sheet of drywall by just simply doubling the price and calling it an additional $15 for all that handling while charging an additional $150 for the handling of that faucet that I just tossed on the floor there. And really, really, really number four here is kind of important. And this does vary state by state. You do have to check with your state's laws, but in many, many, many states, if you are selling something that you purchased to a consumer, for more than you purchased it for, you now legally are required to charge sales taxes for that. So you might be in a state where your labor does not need sales taxes charged, but the materials, if you're marking them up, do need sales taxes charged. So if you're marking them up and not charging sales taxes, you're breaking the law. But if you are charging sales taxes, now you have a whole new documentation system that you must keep up with very precisely in order to account for each and every individual sales tax amount, it's gotta be broken out separately and calculated separately. And that's just additional work and worry that I don't think any of us need. So you can check on your state. Perhaps you're in a state that does allow you as a tradesman to add a markup to your materials without charging sales tax, but chances are you're in a state that is going to require you to now track all of that separately and start charging sales taxes for all of your materials. Argument number five is gonna boil down to online reviews. And this one, 
I'm gonna be honest, is not as big of a deal to me because I really don't want to attract cheap clients anyways. But one of the issues you're going to find is I'm gonna use this faucet as a very big example here is because this faucet, if the client knows the faucet that's going into their house, so they book with me and I go and I buy their faucet, it's $150, they see the box, they know what it is, I charge them $300 for that faucet and then they can just go to Home Depot or they can pull up Home Depot on their phone and look that faucet up and see that the faucet that I just purchased was $150 and that I just now charged them $150 to go to Home Depot, pick up the faucet and bring it back to their house. They're not going to be happy and many of them are going to go leave bad reviews. Now, if you're like me, believe it or not, I do not care about reviews. I don't need reviews. I don't know if I even have reviews, and if I, if I do, I don't know what they would be. They could be horrible, they could be amazing, doesn't matter to me because I work business to business. All of my clients are property managers, and they're not going and looking at Google reviews to see how the guy that they've been using for the last four years is viewed by other people. But I do think most of you are using reviews, and most clients, when polled, when these big companies do these polls of everybody, most people do say that Number one, the very first thing that affects whether or not they're going to hire somebody is going to be word of mouth referrals. But right behind that, number two is online reviews. So even though you may not care that somebody is upset that you just did what you thought was fair to get reimbursed for your time and efforts, they are very likely to go leave a bad review if they feel that they've been screwed over or gouged by you by you doubling the price of that $150 faucet to $300. And that bad review is, in the long run, going to affect how many future clients you get. So I do still feel that even though I don't care about my online reviews, if you do care about online reviews, either don't mark up materials or at the very least don't mark them up very much. But as with sheetrock example with the drywall, if you don't mark up very much, then now you're only making $10 to transport an entire sheet of drywall across town. Argument number six is going to be very similar to the last one, but it's going to have more to do with losing potential clients. So you go do an estimate for somebody, and maybe they've paid you for the estimate, maybe they didn't. We're going to do a whole other video on whether we should charge for estimates, and we can fight over that as well. But argument number six that I'm making is going to be this. You go do an estimate for somebody, you've broken it down a certain way for them. I think if you're smart, you've just given them one big price for a bathroom remodel. You've just said, here's all the things I'm going to do, and here's the final price. But if you are breaking down your pricing, which a lot of clients are just not gonna hire you if you don't do, if you are breaking down your pricing and they can see, once again, that that $150 faucet you're charging $300 for, and if they can just simply go and look that faucet up and see exactly what it costs at Home Depot and see that you've doubled the price of it without much of an explanation as to how that extra 150 is justified, compared to the extra 15, that it would have been for the drywall. If you can't explain that difference, and that's fine guys, don't explain. I don't do a lot of explaining either, but if you would like for them to say yes to that estimate, and if that estimate is itemized, they're going to see that and you're going to lose more estimates. More people are going to say no because they're going to feel that you are unfairly gouging them on materials. All right, argument number seven is I think going to be a very valid one that you're gonna run into quite frequently. And that's gonna be somebody just simply verbally asks you for a ballpark estimate for a quick and easy job. So again, we're gonna use this faucet as our example. Somebody says, hey, you know what? I could use a new faucet. What do you charge to put in a new faucet? Now, if you were doing markups, you're gonna to need to know in order to know what you're gonna charge for that faucet. If that's part of your method for how you get your income, then you haven't worked the acquisition of that faucet into your labor pricing, right? You've worked it into your materials markup pricing. So now you need to know how much that faucet's going to cost so that you can then double that number in your head so that you can then give them a quick ballpark estimate. It's not the end of the world, right? It's not the worst thing ever, but it is one more example as to how this becomes inconvenient and makes running your business a little less efficient and a little more rocky, as opposed to, if you treat all materials as simply pass-through and you've already worked into your labor pricing the acquisition of materials, then when somebody says, what does it cost to get a faucet installed? You can just simply say $150 plus materials. You pick your faucet and whatever faucet you pick, I'll go pick that faucet up and it'll be $150 plus the cost of the faucet. 
They can go check the cost of the faucet. They can go look at 15 different faucets and really spend a lot of time trying to decide which one they like the most. They can go to Home Depot in person themselves and stand in the aisle for three hours picking the perfect faucet. And it does not affect your business whatsoever because you have already rolled your pricing for the materials into your labor. Or if it's something more complicated than a faucet, then you've already rolled the pricing for all of the materials acquisition for that larger project into your labor pricing. And my very last argument, a very big argument actually, is depending on what state you're in, again, also depending on whether you are a licensed contractor or not. So you're gonna need to check all the regulations. But many, many states and counties and cities and other municipalities are going to have their own laws, rules, and regulations in place for markups. And they may restrict you from being able to mark up enough or they may require you to mark up a very specific amount, above or below a very specific amount. So you are going to need to be very careful to make sure that you're following the law in your state, city, county, or other municipality when it comes to doing your markups, because a lot of places are going to view that as gouging. So here's my conclusion, guys. Every job has an ultimate value to the client. So it may be a faucet replacement. That faucet replacement with that specific faucet plus your labor, plus whatever it is that you throw in to make the experience for your client special, you can charge any number of different ways. Maybe it's four or $500, but whatever that value is, when you charge that value, that's the value. That's the final, ultimate, end of the day, the price they pay you for a job well done. Now to you, the provider of the service, it doesn't really matter where the pricing got placed on the invoice. You can charge $300 for labor and 100 for materials, or you can charge 100 for labor and 300 for materials if in the end you're still getting your $400. But for the client, it does matter. For the client, seeing a faucet get doubled in price for what appears to them to be no good reason. Seeing that faucet get doubled in price, that's going to bother them a lot. Whereas seeing you as being an expensive handyman, that's just an expensive handyman. And they knew your pricing before you did the job hypothetically. What you don't want, I think, is for them to come and say, hey, regardless of whether he's expensive or affordable, this handyman cheated me. This handyman went and paid $150 five minutes down the road and came back and charged me another $150 on top of that just for a quick shopping trip. And again, yes, it is legitimate for us to charge for our time. 100%. I am never, ever, ever making the argument when I say you shouldn't mark up. I am not saying that you shouldn't charge for the time and resources that you invested into acquiring, handling, and transporting materials. What I'm saying is that the best way to do that is not going to be to apply a set percentage to every single material across the board as if they're all equal. Now, some of the caveats here are going to be, let's say you have a plumbing company and you deal with lots of elbows and couplers and 90s and 45s and whatnot, end caps and stuff, if you're dealing with a lot of those types of items, especially if it's a bigger company with multiple employees and trucks and stuff, yes, markups may be a good way to simplify a lot of your inventory and a lot of your markup for that inventory. There are plenty of examples. However, this is just, this is my reasons for running my business the way that I do. I'd just simply like you to consider the arguments that I have for it. And again, like I said, I'd like you to go listen to some other people argue the other side of the coin so that you can make the best decision for your business. So until I see you guys next time, I love you. I hope you're out there killing it and I'll see you on the next one.